Hello and welcome to Tank and Affy News. My name is Tom and today we are looking at a book, as we often do. Um, this one is Images of War, the Amex 13 Light Tank, A Complete History. Rare Photographs from Wartime Archives by M.P. Robinson, Peter Lau, and Guy Gabo, Gabau, however you say that. Um, sorry, not good with French words or names. Um, so a while back, as most of you know, I collect 172 scale pre-built and die cast, and I had earlier, um, over the summer, got this little 172 scale Amex 13 model. And the Amex 13 is not a vehicle I ever spent a lot of time thinking about or reading about, partly because uh, there just hasn't been a lot written in English on it, a uh, substantial amount. Um, I was sort of surprised when I looked. Uh, you would think that there would be a new Vanguard Osprey title on it, but I, I don't think there is. You know, there's just a couple smaller pamphlet-sized things, but it's not gotten much attention, which is odd considering how successful this vehicle was, uh, both within French service and on the export market. And for what an interesting vehicle it is. It has a lot of uh, things about it that are different than other light tanks of the era. Uh, obviously the, the oscillating turrets one, the sort of front-mounted engine. Um, it's it's an interesting little vehicle. And so of this came in a batch of about like six or seven different models, and I probably spent more time staring at this thing than anything else that I got in that batch, um, wondering about it. So I went and looked up to see, okay, what is out there and available on this tank in terms of books. And like I said, I was surprised at how little there was. Uh, but fortunately, within the last couple of years, uh, the Images of War series has published this book, AMX 13 Light Tank, Complete History. And I, at first, sort of was like, hmm, because Images of War books, and I've reviewed several of them. This is the first, this one is, by the way, is not a review copy. I just, I just bought this one off Amazon. Um, this series tends to be mostly more of a photo history. Um, so it generally doesn't get too deep into... The history of any particular vehicle like i said they're more photo history books and and those are fine you know for photo history books i mean i've i have tons of them myself they're, they're fine for what they are uh but this one's quite a bit different than some of the other entries in the images of war series it's quite a bit thicker um so you know most of the ones in here are only about maybe i would say two-thirds as thick as this one so it's it's an interesting series because it's not quite as um formulaic as say like osprey new vanguard where they are always the same page count same style it's uh you know you know exactly what you're getting with with the images of war series they they tend to vary a bit depending on the topic which is it's sort of nice that they give the authors a little more flexibility d depending on on the topic and how deep they want to go into it uh so i could i could definitely say this is the 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 largest of the images of war series that I've seen in terms of page count and the most detailed in terms of looking at a particular vehicle. Um, M.P. Robinson's written quite a bit about uh, French vehicles. Um, I have some of his Kagero photo sniper books on the MX-30 and the Leclerc. So I was, um, I saw his name and said, okay, well, I, I know he knows what he's talking about. Um, and these other two authors I was less familiar with, but they provided um, sort of French military veteran experience people first-hand experience operating these vehicles which is nice um so this is a pretty decent book I, I was pretty pleased with it um it does give you a pretty good history of the mx-13 um, which is a, like i said an interesting vehicle it is probably the most successful french tank on the export market with the possible exception of the old world war one era renault ft so, you know, French tank development and tank, their, their success in the export markets really had sort of its ups and downs. Um, I think you could say of French tank development. I mean, obviously, they are one of the countries that invented the tank. Um, I mean, during World War I, them and Britain, are ba they're both basically in, in, inventing the tank at the same time. The British get theirs on the field first, so they generally get the credit. Um, but the French had come up with the idea themselves, and by 1917 had their own vehicles out there in the field. Um, of very varying effectiveness, uh, but the the Renault FT, of course, being probably the most important tank design to come out of World War One and the most influential, and that one obviously was a big export success. Um, or in the case of like with the U.S., you know, where they licensed the design for foreign production, and then some of their other tanks in the 1920s and 30s would go on to be uh, exported. So some of the other, primarily light tanks, the French 
have had success with light tank designs. Um, so things like the R-35 got exported to a few different countries. Obviously, during World War II, Frank, uh, French tank design um, development was halted by the fall of France in 1940, and the reputation of French tanks took a pretty severe ding from that uh, disaster. Uh, but uh, a certain amount of French tank development carried on in secret, at least on paper during the war, and then after the war, the French got back into developing tanks. And it's impressive that uh, not that long after the war, um, they are able to come up with a design as innovative as the MX-13. Um, granted, with some help from U.S. funding, um, as the book explains, but they introduced uh, this vehicle, and it became quite a success on the export market, and it's a quite original design. There's, you know, if you look at it, it doesn't resemble anything that was in use during World War II, which was really just, you know, a decade prior or, or less to the introduction of this vehicle. Um, you've got what is essentially, um, you know, a, a rear-mounted turret with the engine in the front. You've got this oscillating turret design. Um, and, you know, one of the interesting things, it's the first light tank that's really optimized for a particular role. So before World War II, a light tank was literally just a tank that was light. I know that sounds ridiculous to say, but the thing was light tanks were expected to do all the things that tanks do. Um, so they were kind of designed you know, sort of along the same lines as other tanks, they're just generally a little smaller and less uh, well-armored because the idea was that they would be lighter and faster. And would, but they're still intended to carry out sort of the primary missions of tanks. That is, um, you know, exploitation being the primary, one of the primary weapon systems of the armored divisions as they carry out their mission. After the war, and, and really during the war, most people realized light tanks really weren't very good at that. Um, so they become more and more of a niche vehicle used in specialized roles. Um, you know, reconnaissance, uh, flank security, and the, people start to sort of design design them for f very more niche roles. And this was very much intended to be a air transportable tank destroyer. So it is a light tank, but it's really optimized for that role. So you know, the the thirteen in the name refers to the tonnage. So it was only supposed to be thirteen tons. It was supposed to fit um, easily inside of an airplane and you could fly it in and unload it and you would have a vehicle with enough punch that it could destroy enemy tanks um, but it would be quick and easy to get it to the battlefield and it would be highly mobile um, armor protection not so much and as far as doing sort of like the general purpose tank things it's not well suited for that because uh, it's really suited for the anti-armor uh, role and that's in part because with the auto loader and the drums, the way that the ammunition's loaded, it's sort of hard to switch between different types of ammunition. Um, and this gun's really optimized for the anti-armor role. And, you know, there are sources that say this is a copy of the, the German 75mm, the long-barreled 75 that was on the Panther. Um, it is related in that the French had Panthers after the war. They did look at that gun and use it sort of as the baseline for... Um, this design, but this design does use, it's, it's a different breech, it's a different shell um, shape and size, it's a different gun, but it's very similar in performance. Um, and then of course later on, because the vehicle was so successful and s stuck around, they would come up with a uh, more powerful version, so 90, uh, 90mm and 105mm versions. Um, but it was very much um, sort of designed to fill that uh, tank destroyer niche to a certain extent, you know, to the, to the, to the, to the extent that when they did have to use them in sort of that sort of general, like as a, just a tank um, in Algeria, where they just uh, need a light tank for um, fighting an insurgency, they start taking turrets off of old M24 Chaffee light tanks and putting them on the hull of one of these because their Chaffee, Chaffee tanks were, out, were getting worn out. But that turret and gun were much more suited for sort of general tank stuff, you know. Since they're not fighting other tanks in Algeria, they're, they're, they're fighting insurgency. So that's sort of one of those examples where you do just need a light tank. But, you know, the trend has been after since World War II that away from the light tank is just an all-around, you know, uh, armored fighting vehicle to more niche roles, whether it be, you know, airborne assault vehicles or tank destroyers or you know, infantry fighting vehicles, all the, the light view, the light tank is, is becoming more, more and more rare. There are a few examples, but, uh, so in the, in the MX-13, sort of the bridge, um, they called it a light tank, but it was sort of specialized for a specific role, a couple roles, like I said, air, air transportability, 
and anti-tank. Um, okay, so that was sort of a long sidetrack and rant, but hey, you know what? It's my video. I can say what I want. So let's talk about that. And that's all sort of detailed a little bit in the book. I mean, they don't get into sort of those larger issues of what it meant for light tank development overall, but it just does describe those, those uh, qualities of the MX-13. So let's get into the actual book. Um, index, so say well over 200 pages. Um, it is primarily, it's still primarily a photograph book, um, as the title implies, but it does, like I said, have quite a bit more text than, than some of the books in this series. Um, so you can see here we start with design, funding, and production. You can see there's quite a bit of text here describing, and then a lot of these images of early versions of the vehicle, which is quite interesting. And you can learn a lot from these captions, because they are filled with lots of information. Um, but you can see here, so a significant amount of text. Um, so then we get into production. Rebuilds and updates. So here are some charts, info charts, which is nice. Enter service. Yeah, we'll flip ahead here. We don't need to look at every single page because you should just go buy the book yourself if you want to see every page. I'm not going to show them all. And so like you can see, the rest of the book primarily is photographs, but, you know, sort of a paragraph here and there. And, you know, when you're talking about a 200-page book, uh, that adds up after a while. Here we can see an example of the M24 turret on the hull of the MX-13, as I mentioned earlier. Um... So yeah, primarily black and white. Um, the the paper quality is nice. The photo reproduction is good. Um, no complaints there. And like I said, there's a they have some of these. There's a few of these different um, organizational charts. So this is the division 1967 and brigades. Division 1977. Uh, you can see quite a bit more text. So this is there's quite a bit of. Uh, Facts in this book. Now, the, and there are some sections here with color photographs, so that's nice. Uh, just to break up the black and white. Uh, and of course, this is sort of from an era where photography is kind of going from predominantly black and white to predominantly color. Um, it does get a bit into foreign service, although, you know, I was sort of surprised there wasn't as much on Israeli use in the book as I thought there would be, because um, obviously the Israelis were one of the large uh, customers and used them in the 56 um, and 67 wars um, and later, although you know the Israelis were not terribly fond of the vehicle from what I understand, it just wasn't armored well enough for, for what they needed. Um, but that's also just, you know, they have, they have a particular application that they needed and they, they preferred something just a bit more substantial. Um, and, you know, it goes through all the different sub-variants of the, the vehicle. Uh, obviously, it was the basis of a whole family of armored vehicles, different designs. Because, um, you know, the chassis, the way it's designed, or the engine in the front, it sort of lends itself quite easily to being converted into other uses. So whether it be self-propelled gun or armored personnel carrier. Um, or even engineering vehicles. We saw some examples of bridging vehicles here in the back, modernizing. So they're still AMX, they're, you know, despite their age, they're still out there, um, or at least uh, some of the variants. And here we have some pictures of Israeli use. Uh, and let's see. One good thing that's always nice to see is a substantial number of notes. So a little bit of a scholarly touch to the book that they provide notes so you know where they're getting their information from. In fact, quite a few pages of notes here. So that's always good to see. And 237 pages total. Uh, this goes for $28.95 in the U.S., so just a little under $30. Bucks. Um, and I definitely enjoyed it. I think it's well worth it because uh, it is, as far as I know, and as far as in English, this is by far the one of the few and, and the best books on the, on the AMX-13. And... Um, even if there was other stuff out there, it's I think it's one I could I could definitely recommend. Like I say, uh, M. P. Robinson is a guy I've I've read some of his other stuff, and he knows how to put a book together. And 
so yeah, I was very pleased with this one. This is probably, of the Images of War series, the best one that um, I have found. But that's also because I like books that have a little more text to them that are more than just a, a photo collection. And also this one's very specific. Some of the Images of War series are a little more general titles, and I've reviewed some of those where it's like Armor of the Eastern Front. Well, you know, it's such a big topic, you're not going to put that in one book. It's more a more book for probably somebody who's a little... Uh, starting out and just, you know, getting interested in the topic, rather than somebody like myself who's gone well down the rabbit hole over the years. Um, so, anyhow, uh, I'm sure you can find this easily on Amazon or your local book seller can order you a copy, and uh, I hope that they publish more things like this, because French armor is interesting and there's just not enough out there in English. So, publishers, French armor, more please. Thank you. All right. Catch you on the next one.